Gracious and holy Lord, even when we don't see it, we know you are working. And so now, may we see the signs of your presence that are everywhere. Lord, these last few days, we have been spending them in lots of preparation for those people that are not able to prepare as we have. And for the people who do not have the safety that we have, for them now, Lord, we pray. Forgive us for the times this week that we have been too self-consumed that we don't remember to also offer out a hand to our neighbor and to make sure that the person living next to us and the person across the street and the person across the city has the same things that we have. Forgive us, Lord, if any of our intentions did not come as we meant for them to be. Lord, on this day too, as we know people are beginning to gather in their homes, we pray for the many who are extroverts, who need people. May you send them company in a new way. Provide them fellowship, Lord, in ways that they can still find joy. And for the people, Lord, who are introverted, for the people who need that time of privacy, we pray for them so that they too can reach out when they need it. We also pray this day for medical teams and medical facilities all over the world. Continue to guide decisions as people are having to make judgments and triage and give care for people in nursing homes and hospitals and all over the globe, Lord, whether they've been diagnosed or not diagnosed or families or friends are traveling, whatever it may be, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on every situation so that people can have your comfort and your peace. And Lord, may we not live as people of fear, but may we live as people confident that we are yours. Amen. And now, from our chapel to the chapel that you've created, a message from our senior pastor, Dr. Tom Davis. Good morning. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for being with us. This has been one crazy week, hasn't it? I don't know anybody who would have thought this week would have wound up this way. Uh, Certainly last week we wouldn't have guessed that we'd be live streaming, having canceled services for today. You know, you you plan your work and work your plan, and and, uh, all of a sudden life happens, and those plans are not at all what you expected. And that's very much the theme that I want to start from this morning. I remember a particular time in my life that uh, I had planned my work and worked my plan, and I was thinking things were going along right the way that, that I had planned them. I had worked my way through college. After college, I, I was pastoring a, a small church while I was working my way through seminary. And at the end of seminary, at the end of those three years, I uh, became associate pastor in a small town. I got to be good friends with one of the pastors in that town, and he and I shared a lot of the same interests, and one of those interests was cars. Um, I don't know if you know much about cars, but this particular car we got, well, it's called an MGB, and it's not much of a car. As a matter of fact, the people who who made the electrical parts of that car is is a company called Lucas, and uh, we were pretty sure they were the people who invented darkness. I mean, this car, there was always something going wrong with it, electric, the electronics of it, and it gave us a lot of opportunities, an opportunity to walk fairly often, an opportunity to phone a friend fairly often, an opportunity to work on the car very, very, very often. It was, um, it was, it was not much of a car, but we loved it. It was convertible, and this time of year, it was a great time that um, put down the top, turn up the radio, and just drive out in the country. Well, it was my day to have the car. And it was after work. I put down the top. Gorgeous day. 
turn up the radio. I was driving out in the country, and I had this great big loop that I would do. And I got to the end of the loop, and when I, uh, I discovered that they'd closed the road that I was going to go back into town on, well, I turned around, and about the time I turned around, it sounded like I had somebody in my back seat blowing the horn. And uh, sure enough, I looked in my rearview mirror, and there was a truck that was so close, I couldn't see anything but its grill in my rearview mirror. And they were just laying on their horn. And then the truck pulled up beside me, and the, the passenger started banging on the side of the truck, said, pull over. Well, I was in an MG. There was no way I was going to outrun them. I thought they were going to run me off the road. So I pulled over, and there were three of the... They looked like lumberjacks. They were huge. Three of the biggest guys that God ever breathed breath into. And the biggest one of the three, who looked like Superman's older brother, began to get out of the car. And I say he began to get out of the car. It took him a while to, to unravel. I, he got out and... He just started screaming at me, and he started calling me everything but a child of God, and just, he was furious. He said, your car threw up a rock and busted my windshield, and you're going to pay for it. Well, I reached in my coat pocket, and I pulled out my wallet, and I, I had $30. I gave him all the money I had, and I said, here's $30. And he said, it's not enough. Then he pulled out a gun, and he hooked it up under my jaw, he pushed me over in the seat, and he just kept pushing me with the muzzle of his gun. And he said, I'm going to blow your head off. You were just showing off. And I said, well, if I was showing off, I wouldn't have stopped my car. I wasn't showing off. And then he just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. He said, I'm going to blow your head off. And I said, I wasn't showing off, and I gave you all the money that I have. And he said, get out. I'm going to stomp you all over the highway. Now, this guy was big enough to go bear hunting with a switch. And I might have come up to his waist, maybe. He was, he was, he was huge. And so I looked at him, and I, I said, if, if you want to stomp me all over the highway, you, can, you could probably do it. Well, I don't think it was what he was accustomed to hearing in his bar fights or whatever. So he kind of cocked his head a little bit, and he said, get out, I want to show you my windshield. So I got out and looked at his windshield, and sure enough, there was one of those little chinks like a, a rock had, had bounced off his windshield. And he said, you know, my baby had to go without, and all weekend I worked on this windshield, and here you're showing off, and you, you busted it. And then I said, well, I know $30 isn't enough to pay for it. Why don't you give me your name and number, and I'll send you more money? Well, he said, no, I'm going to get your tag in case you try and call the law on me. I said, I'm not going to call, call the law on you. I said, just give me your name and number. And he started writing down my tag number. He said, do you have a business card? Well, I'm going to set this up a little bit. I had just graduated seminary. I was 25 years old, and I looked like I was 12. Um, so I grew a little mustache. So I looked like a 12-year-old with a mustache. And I had to think a minute about a business card because I'd never used one of them. But this woman in my church had made 500 business cards for me. She had a little printing company, and she made 500 business cards, and I'd put them in my coat. And so I said, sure. And I pulled out a business card, and I, I gave it to him. And he looked at it, and it said, Reverend Tom Davis. And he couldn't get his eyes off the card. And he said, are you Reverend Davis? And I said, yes. Well, that's when his voice cracked a little bit. He said, I didn't know you were with the church. And then this tear welled up and drooped down his, his cheek. He, he, he said, God's been working on my temper. And I'm thinking, you mean it was worse before? And then he said, preacher, I want you to pray for me. I said, buddy, I've been praying for you and me both from the time you stepped out of your car. He said, I know you must have because I was going to, I was going to. I said, I know you were going to. And so he started crying, and we prayed there on the side of the road. And he got in his car, and he took off. Well, it, it, just in case you don't know me, that doesn't happen to me every week. You know, sometimes a whole month goes by that folks don't pull a gun on me. And I, that, it, it, it came out in my sermon on Sunday. I mean, 
Uh, we've all got, uh, got a sermon down deep. You might think you don't have a sermon, but we all have a sermon down deep. And, and when the time of pressure comes, when the hard times come, when the heartache comes, that sermon comes out. And that sermon, it came out that Sunday. And the church was a great church. And I don't think the people there were any different than the people anywhere else. But there was one comment that they said more than anything else. And I think that's, that's what surprised me more than anything else. The one thing that they said was, what were you doing there? Do you hear what's implied with that? That you must have done something wrong for there to be suffering, for there to be heartache. That, that, that if you don't mess with the dog, it won't bite you. That if, if you don't swat at the bee, it won't sting you. That... We, we like to surround ourselves and think that, that, that everything in this world is, is just about keeping us safe and comfortable. And if we're not safe and comfortable, that we must have done something wrong and that there's a, a straight line between our heartache and something that we've done wrong. Did you know Jesus talks about that? And... It's right here in Luke chapter 13. And I'm going to read Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And the hymn that's being spoken of here, it's Jesus. It says, Now on the same occasion there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he began telling this parable. A certain man had a fig tree which had been planted in the vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine, but if not, cut it down. Well, this is obviously talking about uh, a situation, something that had happened that Jesus and his listeners all knew about. It was when the ruler Pilate had, had killed and slaughtered a, a bunch of worshipers who were coming from Galilee to the temple. And he didn't, he didn't just kill them. He killed them and he mingled their blood with their own sacrifices. Well, they couldn't imagine anything worse than this. So they said, can't we draw a straight line between their suffering and they must have done something wrong. They must have been in the wrong place at the wrong time that, um, you know, dogs won't bite if you don't mess with them and bees won't sting if you don't swat at them. There's some correlation between, you know, suffering and, and what they did. Well, Jesus has a quick answer and a one-word answer for that. He says, I tell you, no. Well, it doesn't get any plainer than that. I tell you, no. That this is what theologians talk about when they, they talk about moral evil. It's evil that t- people choose to do. That it's, it's free will. That the, the same free will that allowed the worshipers to go from Galilee to the temple is the same free will that allowed the ruler Pilate to choose to to murder them. I remember years ago, there was a a girl that was hit and killed by a drunk driver. I was trying to console the family, and while I was visiting with the family, 
they began to share with me about someone, I guess, who had good intentions, who told the family, well, you know, it's God's will. He really has something important to teach you. Well, they're completely flummoxed by that. How do we know the will of God? And, and, and we'd like to draw the straight line between bad things happening and, and the will of God, and maybe somehow we can get some meaning out of it if, if, if God called it to happen. But we know the will of God by looking to Scripture. And Hebrews is a book that was written for those who were teaching the Christian faith. And the first book, the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, verse 3 says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. That if we want to know the will of God, if we want to know the nature of God, that we look to Jesus. And I want to go ahead and tell you, if, if you look at, at Jesus, we never find one place where he poured alcohol down somebody's throat and said, go, be as reckless and kill who you want because this is my will. That wasn't any more God's will than the ENT who tried to save that girl's life was working against God's will. That we live in a world of suffering and heartache. We live in a world where suffering is real. There may be a time where there's no sorrow. There may be a time where there's no suffering. But now is not that time. We live in a day and a time where suffering is real. We live in a day and a time where sorrow is real. We live in a day and a time where Jesus is real. And there's a world that, that needs to know that. But Jesus doesn't stop right, his story right there in talking about moral evil. He goes on to talk about another situation that the people knew. About the Tower of Siloam that fell and killed 18 people. Well, it doesn't say there was sabotage or bad construction practices. It just says that the Tower of Siloam fell. Well, we call that gravity when things fall. Or among, in theological circles, it, it might be natural evil. That's the arena that we live in. It wasn't that anybody chose to do wrong or chose to do bad. It's that when towers fall, they hurt people. They don't float up. That gravity is a part of the arena that we live in. It's a natural part of the arena that we live in. But it's not only gravity, it's um, also things like uh, warm winds and, and cool water meet together on the ocean and, and cause hurricanes that low pressure systems come in with with, with cold air and they cause tornadoes and people are hurt. It's not that, that God starts twirling the wind with his finger and, and says, I'm going to hurt these people because there's no straight line. It's, that's the arena that we live in. It's a, an arena with, with gravity. It's, a, it's an arena with thermodynamics that, that cause tornadoes. It's an arena that has virus. An illness. It's an arena that, that's always been here. It's an arena that the, the world has been dealing with for a long, long time. We'd like to, to believe that this world was made to keep us safe and sound, and if, if things don't don't go our way to keep us safe and sound, that something terrible has gone wrong. No, suffering's real. Heartache is real. But Jesus is real. 
So he doesn't stop his story just to talk about suffering and heartache. He goes on to tell a parable. And it's a parable about a a tree that wasn't bearing fruit. And it's the gardener that intervenes. It's the gardener that is put to work. It's the gardener that begins to dig. It's the gardener that begins to to fertilize, to make sure that, that that tree has every chance to bear fruit. We have a gardener. His name is Jesus. And, and what he did on the cross for you and for me was in order that, that, that you and I might bear fruit. He took all those things that would destroy us, all those things that would conquer us, and he took them on himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might be made right with God. He took the sin, he took the heartache that would conquer us, he took the, the fear that would destroy us, he took the anxiety and the worry that would grind us into nothing and he took it on himself. And he nailed it to the cross. And when he nailed it to the cross, he took away its power once and for all. He's done the hard work. He's done what you and I couldn't do for ourselves. And when he rose from the grave on the third day, he gave us power that you and I don't have on our own. Philippians 4, 19 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's his power who strengthens you and me, who gives us power in that long journey, sometimes through suffering, sometimes through heartache, very often through fear, anxiousness and worry. He did that for you and for me when he rose from the grave. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of, of fear, but of power and love and discipline. That he's given us power over all those things that would destroy us, that we might, might bear fruit. Fruit. Where we, where we, we begin to, to practice a fruit of gratitude, a fruit of praise. You and I, we make our plans, and then life happens. And when life happens, we continue to practice the the fruits of gratitude, the fruits of praise, the fruits of prayer, the fruits of... This may be the best time ever to draw your children close And start a time of of devotion. A time to to read a a scripture verse. We've got resources on our website, on Roswell Kids, that that you can find devotions for you and for your family, and you can begin that time. You can read scripture, and, and, and in it, you can ask kids what they think, and guess what? They'll tell you. They'll tell you with some insights that maybe you never would have known. You ask your children, what do you want to thank Jesus for? And guess what? They'll tell you. Not thanks to goodness, but thanks to Jesus. And they'll practice those fruits. And you can practice those fruits with them. It's a good time, yes, to draw children close to you. As a husband, as a wife. To begin to to share your praise to share your your gratitude together. And as a family to say, who do we need to pray for that needs the power, the power of Jesus in their lives? And to begin to share those things. To think, to think of that one person, maybe in your neighborhood, who might be alone. And and this is a good time where you, you practice Practice the fruit that Christians have have always practiced, that you reach out 
to that person, to let them know that they're not alone. It may be that um, you're the one that's in the hard place. If you are in the, the, the need of, uh, immediate need of food or uh, of having prescription medicines delivered to you, don't hesitate. Call our emergency hotline. We'll get someone delivering that to you. It may be that you want to help make those deliveries. We've got a lot of different types of, of, of driving and delivering that, that needs to be done. Every summer, one of the things that we do is Roswell United Methodist, this place of community and faith, we deliver over a thousand lunches a day to kids that are on the school lunch program. Well, during the next two weeks, they're going to need that. Monday morning, we're going to, we're going to get together with Must Ministries and figure out well, how can we continue to, to make sure that the children are fed right here, right where we live, and we want to be a delivery part of that system. And we might need your help. Check the church website. The resources on our church website that um, maybe can help you or a way for you to reach out to a neighbor. You know, Leo and, and Jacob make incredible meals here every Wednesday. Well, it's not just going to be Wednesday. That It may be that we can freeze those meals and, and, and you can send them out. Check the church website. It'll tell you what the menus are and you might want to purchase a meal for pickup or, or for someone to deliver it for you. This is an opportunity. Yes, for us to produce good fruit. It's also an opportunity for us to, to continue to practice hurtful fruit as well. We have a choice. And the reason we have a choice is because we have a gardener, a savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He's come alongside. He's done the hard work. He's done the digging. He's done what, what you and I can't do for ourselves. And he rose from the grave to give us power and love and discipline. My hope and my prayer for you is this becomes a, a time of power, a time of love, and a time of discipline. Because there's a world out there, a community out there that needs you and needs Jesus. Pray with me. Jesus, I'm thankful that you give us strength when we don't have it. You give us power when we don't have it. You conquered fear, death, sin, anxiousness, all those things that would destroy us. You conquered it on the cross. And you rose again to give us not that spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. Breathe your spirit on us that we might bear that fruit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.